Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Ardo Cal here with you every Tuesday and Friday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well. The NHL on ESPN YouTube. It's the Tuesday edition. So why don't we start with some winners and losers, Greg Wyshynski. Winner, Austin Matthews, baby. 60 goals for the second time in three seasons. Matthews is the ninth player in NHL history to have multiple 60 goal seasons, but the only active NHL player to do so. And Arda, how about the Leafs fans in Buffalo chanting, we want 60 again, a Toronto invasion. You always like to see it, except if you live in Buffalo. Uh, great stat from Flow Buds on Twitter that Matthews has more career goals than any player drafted since 2010 onward, and he was drafted in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Matthews, the only American-born player to score 60 goals in a season. He has now done it twice to go back to our conversation on a previous episode about will he end up being the best American-born player of all time. Uh, signs point to yes, Arda. Yes, indeed. This is the Brett Hull rule, of course, because Brett Hull was born in Canada, even though he did represent the United States. But nevertheless, <laughs> uh, Austin Matthews and also my one of my favorite stats throughout all this also is he's outpacing Alex Ovechkin with this many games played. But of course, uh, does American machine break? I guess we're going to find <laughs> out later in his career. He has been more injury prone is what I'm saying than Alex Ovechkin throughout his career, but still uh, extremely impressive and only more to come, which is awesome. Indeed, Loser. Indeed. Loser Ryan Hartman. Uh, Hartman was rightfully upset about officials missing a high stick by Noah Hannafin in a wild Golden Knights game of the weekend, uh, a play near the end of regulation in a tie game that would have certainly put Minnesota in position to win. Uh, but then in overtime, after Jonathan Marshall scored into an empty net to win the game, the Wild did the pull the goalie thing again. Uh, Hartman, according to Mike Russo of The Athletic, uh, spill, uh, spewed some verbal abuse to the officials and threw his stick in their general direction, which earned him a Department of Player Safety hearing. Uh, if suspended, it would be Hartman's third suspension in the last 14 months. One thing I was curious about was that Hartman was getting a hearing with the Department of Player Safety instead of the Hockey Ops Department in the NHL, which usually handles incidents between players and officials. And the explanation that I received was that Abusive officials wasn't called. It was a misconduct penalty for abusive language, I guess it was. Um, since they didn't call that specifically, the NHL is treating it more like an unsportsmanlike conduct that would fall under player safety. It's a little strange to me. I don't know, but that's the explanation. I just found the whole situation a little curious. One of the other headlines you mentioned there was the overtime goalie pull not working in this case. Uh, you brought this up a couple episodes ago, why didn't they pull the goalie to end regulation? They were going to pull the goalie in overtime anyway. If you're risking losing the extra point, why not just risk the point you didn't earn yet uh -huh. in that situation? I, I, I do. I would love to get an answer to that question. Like just the philosophy of that is yeah. an interesting one. I mean, it could, it could be like the ability to pin your opponent in four uh, at four on three better than, you can, and you know, otherwise the end of regulation. I'm sure there's reasons for it. But again, this is like yeah. a new strategy in the NHL. I'm sure we'll see it uh, a change and, and coaches get spun up on what to do uh, as it continues to be employed. Uh, winner, Connor McDavid. McDavid's assist on Saturday night gave him 96 helpers this season, Arda. Uh, his next assist will break a tie with Joe Thornton for the most in a single season in the cap era. There is a chance, Arda, that Connor McDavid could end up with the largest number of assists in a single season for a player not named Wayne Gretzky or Mary Lemieux by the end of this year. Uh, by the way, Gretzky has the NHL record for assists in a single season with 163 in 1985-86. Yeah. Uh, did they even have goalies in the mid-80s? No. Who's to say? We don't have the footage, yeah. uh, but uh, 163 assists for Gretzky there, there was one, There was one goalie. His name was Grant Fuhr. That's it. Every, <laughs> right. every other Only goalie the didn't Oilers had a goalie. Right, yeah, exactly. It. Everybody else that's played it. with an empty net. Did, didn't McDavid have 163 points total last year? Or something close to that. Like, yeah. it was a monumental season, and here we are talking about 163 assists. Insane. That's hilarious. Uh, loser, Giant Arena Projects in Virginia. We touched on this last episode with Molly Walker of the New York Post. Uh, 
Wizards are now going to be staying in Washington, D.C. through uh, 2050 after their arena project in Potomac Yards and Alexandria, Virginia was scuttled, par in, partly due to some political uh, divisions within Virginia between the governor and the uh, Gen Virginia General Assembly. Uh, I said it before, I'll say it again, Arda. I wanted the Caps and Wizards to stay in D.C., especially the Wizards. Uh, I think the vibe of the Capitals is definitely more of a city vibe now than a suburb vibe. Uh, and I'm it, it, happy to see that the city and the Caps and Ted Leonsis have worked something out where they're going to be able to expand a little bit of the footprint of the arena uh, and, uh, and and make the surrounding area even better. Uh, they're a D.C. team now. Don't want to see them in Virginia. D.C. And uh, they're the Caps will stay. Hug it out. Give us another winner. Winner, Jacob Lasner and Brendan Mahoney. Listen to the unbridled enthusiasm <laughs> of these two broadcasters on WZBC, Boston College's radio station, as the Eagles eliminated Quinnipiac in overtime and advanced to the Frozen Four for the first time since 2016. Here's Fortescue at the point. Takes a shot. Takes the fight. Save. Rebound in front of the slot. Clearly. Sorry. Jack below. Jack below. BC's going to the final four. 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 Oh, my freaking God, Brendan. It's happening. It's happening. BC's going to the final four, baby. Let's go. Let's go. What an insane ending to this game. Oh, my God. The reigning champs are dethroned, and Boston College is headed to the Frozen Four. So this was an awesome game. Yeah. Uh, it was also an unexpected game. I don't think many people saw this one going to overtime, given how stacked Boston College is. Correct. But you had the number one overall seed in the nation facing the reigning national champions. That's only happened three or four times in NCAA history. And for it to go to overtime, and it was a heartbreaking goal, too. For for Quinnipiac fans, obviously, you just heard the way it, it played out for, for Boston College. But honestly, it was everything. The, the whole week, I was on the uh, regionals desk in the studio with Andrew Raycroft the whole week. This entire week of college hockey, if you were looking for one sequence of games to show somebody, to, to show them that college hockey is awesome and it's fun and it's exciting, you show them this weekend. And in, in particular, you show them this game because it had everything. Yeah. It was awesome. That, uh, Every every coach I've talked to this season says the talent is completely off the charts in the nation right now, and it's only getting better for NCAA hockey. It's a good time to yep. watch the college boys in America. Uh, finally, the uh, the final loser, Arda, all other Rangers besides Artemi Panarin. <laughs> the bread man was referenced on the penultimate episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm this week as Larry David discussed having post-coital conversations about the New York Rangers, exactly where you'd expect Artemi Panarin's name to come up. Arda, at this point, Larry David should be the most important voice in American hockey. Please recall <laughs> back in 2020 when he went on the Michael K show in New York and complained about how Rangers coach David Quinn was using Capo Caco on the ice. Quinn was fired the next season. One can only assume it was the power of Larry David that led to that coaching change for the Rangers. Uh, great to see hockey referenced on Curb and very excited to see how Curb's going to end up uh, with a series finale next week. Is it bad that I haven't watched this season yet? Terrible, man. Yeah, I got to tell you, it's pretty, pretty good. I knew we were going to go there. <laughs> uh, we got a stacked show today. Uh, Rachel Dory uh, is going to join us a little bit later on. She's begun writing articles for us at ESPN.com, which is extremely exciting. And also, we have a very special guest right now. All right, joining us now on ESPN's The Drop, you will see him at WrestleMania 40 this weekend, April 6th and 7th on Peacock. He'll be facing Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship of the World. Sammy Zayn here on The Drop. Sammy, thanks for taking time for us, buddy. Uh, we're a hockey podcast, so let's dive right into the pucks, man. We're fellow Canadians here. What would you say is your earliest memory of watching hockey or playing hockey watching it's kind of hard to say i feel like it was just kind of always there you know uh my earliest memories are from the late 80s and patrick roy and the cup run and you know the uh losing in the cup finals yeah. to calgary i would say in 89 so i kind of have vivid memories of that but you know i have two older brothers and they were hockey fans in the city you know you know montreal so <laughs> the city was a hockey city, so it felt like it was always kind of there. Uh, and I was pretty in love with hockey. I would say probably from those early memories, 
So I was about 10 or 11, and I, then I think wrestling just completely took over and consumed consumed me. And I, I went to both. But then wrestling really took over from, like, age 10 to 20. And that's when I really kind of dove back into hockey and following it really closely again. Now, you told Montreal's social media team that Patrick Waugh was your favorite player. And you also told them that uh, you were once pushed into his crotch during a Stanley Cup parade in Laval. You said it was a story for another That's time. Correct. That time is now, Sammy. Tell the story about Patrick well, Waugh's crotch. <laughs> I mean, well, you already have the punchline, so there's not much more to go. But uh, we got to the uh, – they had a parade three at City Hall in Laval. And um, we're just at the back of this huge collection of people with a stage up at the front. But I guess but the player's bus showed up and it just happened to park right in the back, right where we were. So all of a sudden we were in the front, right where all the players were getting off the bus. So the door opens and the players start getting out. And, you know, again, memory is funny because it's a little reconstructed. I don't remember if other people were first. In my memory, Patrick Royal was first off the bus. It, but he was definitely the only one I remember because that's when the mob just pushed, like, just, I don't even know how to describe it. Just like a crazy concert where you just get smashed up against the rails if you're in the front. It was the same thing. This mob just pushed me right forward. And I'm like maybe 80 pounds, if that. And I just get <laughs> body slammed, body served in, right into his crotch and kind of like, face uh what do you call it? like stiff arms me almost like at arm's length he's like and he says in french hey whoa, whoa, let's go. which means hey hey uh take it easy there little guy <laughs> and then i i had the the only thing i had on me to sign was the san jose sharks cap that for some reason i had which wasn't even mine it actually belonged to my friend angela decori uh, and it got signed and I, I actually don't know what happened to it to this day I think my brother might have got his rookie card signed, like the Patrick Royal rookie card. But whatever it is, I, I don't have those autographs anymore. I, I don't know where they are. That's one of the sad notes of that story. Uh, what can you do? Hey, listen, you, as a Habs fan, I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, what would be your reaction if the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup this season? Do you have sympathy for the Leafs and their cup drought, or would it kill you to your core as a Habs fan to see the Leafs celebrate? No. I do have sympathy because, look, it is a good hockey market and it's Canada and all that. Like, look, selfishly, the Cup hasn't been in Montreal in, my God, 30 years now. Or in Canada, even. So you have to keep coming back. But, um, you know, of course, I want to come back to Montreal first. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I, um, I, don't know, I don't know if it's blasphemous to say as a Habs fan, but, like, you know, fine. I guess they've suffered enough. You know, uh, every every fan base deserves something nice. You know, Montreal, we've we've had a lot. We've had the record of Stanley Cups, obviously. So I don't know. Um, I'd love to see the Canadians win that cup first, but uh, I think we're still a few years away. And you look at Edmonton, you look at Vancouver, you look at Toronto. All of those guys are those are great teams. They were really built well. Uh, and you know it would it would hurt a lot less if it was Edmonton. I'm actually kind of rooting for Edmonton. Yeah, because David and Drysaitel, like I mean, come on, those are two best players in the world, maybe. And it's like you kind of want you want them. Um, so if Edmonton won, it wouldn't bother me as much. Uh, but definitely, I think if Toronto won, I would not like it as much. But <laughs> fair play to them, you know, like their fans deserve something nice. It's fine. Right. So what we're saying here, Sammy, is uh, when the Leafs win the Stanley Cup, I will invite you to the parade on Young Street, and you'll be there. Uh, we'll have a nice shawarma beforehand, and we'll enjoy the parade. Um, I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> but, like, how do you land those players, you know? How do you get Matthews and Barner and Tavar? Like, how do you get all that? Now I'm getting kind of angry. Now I don't want them to win, actually. <laughs> I'm getting more angry more think about it. <laughs> oh man each round we got to do a check-in on Sami Zayn every round if the Leafs keep winning in the playoffs just keep checking in and seeing your demeanor it gets worse and worse progressively that'd be hilarious crazy thing is though, I feel like the weight of the world is on those guys it really is because there's all these expectations and they haven't been past the first round in all these years so that's got to be in their head 
I don't yeah. know, whatever. We'll I'll watch. I'll watch. We're getting to playoff time. We'll watch. We'll, we'll see what happens. We, we're also getting to WrestleMania time, Sammy. Uh, my WrestleMania question for you is, will you be accompanied to the ring at WrestleMania 40 by Bruce Boudreaux? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, we do see him when we're in Wilk, when Wilkesbury. He's always been very kind uh, to Kevin and myself, particularly Kevin. He loves Kevin. Uh, but he's a really good dude. He's the kind of guy that when you meet, it's like you already know him because he's exactly what you see on television. Like when you see him coaching, whatever demeanor you get, whatever vibe you get from him is exactly him as a person. Just very, very likable. And uh, <laughs> now he's a good guy. I don't think I'll, I'll need him for WrestleMania, but he is a great guy. You guys did a segment together that's on WWE's YouTube right now oh, where he's kind right. of coaching you guys up. What was it like working with him like that? And were you surprised by uh, how he took to it so easily? Uh, yeah, it was just one take, and uh, we were just being real, you know, kind of pretending it was real. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of simplistic, but we just kind of, we just kind of started rolling and talking, and that was it. It was just one, one take. Uh, yeah, he was a natural. <laughs> He's got a big personality. That's awesome. Uh, last one for me. You got Gunther at WrestleMania. I gotta know, what's it like taking a chop from that guy? It's kind of hard to explain. Um, it hurts, but it's almost more like jarring than anything. Like you almost can't believe the the reaction it has on your body. It's just hard to explain. <laughs> it's loud. It's, it's it's very hard to explain. Different from from other strikes for sure. Yeah, there's other strikes that even hurt more. Like his 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 forearms hurt a lot, or his clotheslines are really no walk in the park. But something about that chop, like it just kind of takes your breath away. It does it does weird things to your body. So, I anticipate so, that uh, WrestleMania will probably be uh, loaded with them. I have to anticipate. Uh, Sammy, last one from me. By my estimation, uh, here as we sit in 2024, you are the most successful, definitely the most impactful professional wrestler of all time of Muslim faith. And I'd love to know what that means to you. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe, but I guess you'd have to be right. Um, I see, she could probably be pretty up on that list too. But yeah, it's weird just because as a Muslim kid growing up, there was not really much representation. And if there was, it was never good. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> it was never good representation. It was, uh, you know, you know, the world was different back then. And our business was different back then. And it was uh, sort of these caricatures of these like, rah, 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 you know, crazy Middle Eastern stereotypes. Um, so to be kind of at the center of that, really, when you put it that way, to be the most impactful or the, the one who's done the best or been around the longest or whatever, whatever it is, it's pretty weird to think that's me. Um, and I really hope, I hope that does something for someone the way I think it would have done something for me as a kid, because when I was a kid and Muhammad Ali is actually going to be inducted into the WWE hall of fame this year, but Muhammad Ali was like the only guy I had and it was a different sport, but you know, what a role model he was and what an impact he had on me. Um, so it's great that the world's kind of shifting and that there's more representation, uh, Arabs, Muslims, all that kind of thing. It's wonderful, but it's really surreal when you say it that way. Um, that especially in the world of wrestling, I'd probably be the, the, I don't know, the most obvious or the most impactful or whatever you want to say. It's, I don't know, it's pretty remarkable. And I think the interesting thing about it is because I look the way I look, you know, with fair skin and, and a red, big orange beard and all this, I don't think it really, it's not something that I think most people even think of. It's one of those things that only if you know, you know. Um, you know, Arabs and Muslims will, will take any good representation we can get. So they know, <laughs> you know, um, it, it's, I don't know, it's crazy, man. It's cool. It's cool to also not have that really be my thing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I didn't have to play the part. It's just me. And as I said, if you know that that that's part of, who I am, then you know, but if you don't know, then it's, it's not like, Oh, he's the Arab guy. He's the Muslim guy. No, he's just, I'm just that guy. 
and I happen to be Arab and I happen to be Muslim. And I think that's that's kind of the one thing I always aspired for when I was a kid, because I just assumed that if I ever got into a position like this, I'd have to play some sort of stereotype. But my dream was always to kind of just normalize it. And I think that's kind of the cool thing is, um, is I feel like I've kind of been successful in that respect. Just being a normal guy who happens to be Arab, happens to be Muslim, and hopefully somebody that can positively impact other Arab or other Muslim kids if they're watching. Well said. Well said, Hope, Sammy. Mashallah. <laughs> I hope. I hope. <laughs> Mashallah, yeah. Sammy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you brought WWE cameras to Mecca. Like, who else That's could crazy, do that? Yeah. That's insane. Incredible. That, that was all very surreal. That was very surreal. Yeah, and I think about that too. When, uh, you know, the, our social media team sometimes has us do like uh, Ramadan Kareem or like Eid Mubarak videos and stuff like that. And I'm like, man, I would have loved this when I was a kid. Yes, <laughs> yes. See, like nobody, nobody ever talked about Ramadan or Eid. Like it was, nobody knew what that was. <laughs> you know, um, where I was anyway, where I was growing up. So it's cool. It's just cool to see the shift. It's cool to see the cultural shift. Um, I think we need it. I think we need it right around now. Absolutely. Well, like I said, Sammy, mashallah, that's an incredible what you're doing for uh, your respective communities, our respective communities, quite frankly. And But being the main event guy, the, you know, the esteemed successful superstar that happens to be, like you said, Muslim and Arab. Uh, all the best to you at WrestleMania 40. Again, it's April 6th and 7th on Peacock and Sami Zayn will be challenging Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship uh, and we will check in on you every round uh, as the Leafs progress to the Stanley Cup final <laughs> for the first time since 1967 yeah. and I'll I'll send you a Leafs jersey too so you can wear yeah. it be, be sure to check in with me a couple years down the road when the Habs rebuild is done too all right there you yeah. go <laughs> there you're talking <laughs> Sammy thanks buddy thanks Sammy. thanks so much for having me guys appreciate it all right join us now on the drop New ESPN teammate, Rachel Dory. Boy, it's fun to have someone who knows a thing or two about the draft on staff so I don't have to fake it. This is exciting. <laughs> I'm excited. I mean, I get to be your teammate, which is pretty cool because now we can like do podcasts together and read each other's stuff, help each other out. I'm very excited about it. I'm not going to I'm lie. very excited too. Again, the best thing for me is that, you know, pick 24 from Medicine Hat. I don't even have to learn how to pronounce his name anymore. Very exciting for me. To not have to <laughs> you just send me a text. You're like, what do I need yeah. to know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's get into the draft expertise. Let's start with Macklin Celebrini of, uh, of Boston University. Um, obviously, Boston University makes it through to the Frozen Four over the weekend. Very exciting news. The collision course between BU and BC continues. But I wanted to get your take on Celebrini. Um, you know, he's going to be the first overall pick in the draft, whoever gets that pick in the lottery. Uh, I've heard people say that he is not generational. I've heard people say he is franchise. I've heard, I've heard people say he's simply a superstar. Where do you rank Celebrini? Are we overrating Macklin Celebrini at all? I actually think there's part of his game that gets underrated because of who was in the draft last year. Mm. Um, that's the generational talent, to be clear. Connor Bedard is the generational talent. Every so often, they come along. And so when you look at it, Crosby was the generational talent. Ovechkin, the generational scorer. McDavid, mm. generational talent. Matthews, generational scorer. I look at this and I say, Bedard is the generational talent of like the next sort of wave. But there is no reason that when we're talking first overall pick, he's not in the Bedard, um, McDavid, Matthews tier. But I think he's absolutely in and around like the McKinnon tier. Like oh, he's okay. he's in that tier. And I think he has a chance to do some some real damage, uh, dynamic player, immediate impact. Like, I would be surprised if he didn't come in and have a similar impact to Bedard this year. Hopefully he's on a little bit of a better team and he isn't carrying around like 40-year-old line mates. But there's not a thing this guy can't do, right? He skates incredibly well. His vision is hilariously good. And the difference between him and pretty much every adult he's playing at the college level is he sees plays but actually has the capability to execute on them. And that is going to be huge at the NHL level. That sounds great, except for the fact he's probably going to be a shark and they're like a goal differential of minus 2,000, I think, at last check. So it may, <laughs> it may be very Bedardish for him, I think, next season. But oh, we'll boy. See. We'll see. I mean, they've got some they've, they've got some warm bodies in that roster, probably more than, than Chicago had this year. Um, was there ever a moment where he wasn't atop your draft board for this year? No, not okay. even like not even a little bit. Um, I think... 
Demidov is such a unique talent as well, but super similar to last year where it was like Bedard Michkov. That's sort of the feel I'm getting this year uh, in talking to people is like Demidov is very clearly the second best player in the draft and he's probably not going to go second overall. And so it's kind of one of those things where oh. um, he would be the closest, but Celebrini is sort of in a tier on his own and then everyone else is after that. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, so uh, Demidov, Anton uh, Selyev, both uh, Russian players. They're frequently mentioned for being potential top five picks. You've got uh, Artem uh, Levashenov. I'm terrible at names. Honestly, of Michigan pretty State. close. <laughs> Thank you. I think I did pretty good. Uh, Michigan State, who a lot of people think could go second overall behind Celebrini. Uh, your draft board is out on ESPN.com. What do you have currently in your mock as far as the number two player behind Celebrini? Yeah, so I always say that mocks are different than boards, right? Boards, you're ranking like who the best player is, whereas mocks, you're doing who you actually think is going to go where based on situation, based on history of how that management team drafts. I have Levshinov going to Chicago at number two, just based on reverse order of standings. Mm -hmm. When you look at it, they have a generational talent up front. That's all settled and squared away. And Levshinov is a mammoth human being who took a non-traditional path, is dominating in the NCAA as a defenseman. He is somebody that, if he hits a ceiling, we're talking about a top-pairing, impact, right-handed defenseman. And I think as you and I sit here and we talk about the NHL, those don't really get acquired in trades. Those no. are not available in free no. agency. You no. have to draft them. And yep. so... He might not be the best defender available, but for the tool package that he has, if he hits his ceiling, he's going to be a really big problem in the Western Conference. And I think he fits pretty well in um, to whoever's going to pick second. You can never have enough six foot, enormous right-handed defensemen. And I guess finally on the draft, is there anybody that's sort of rocketed up the board in like the last calendar year that we should keep our eye on? Uh, yeah, familiar name. Um, Tij Aginla is oh, a guy. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the player. Everybody in Calgary is hoping the Flames are in position to draft this year. Yes. Um, so there's that guy. He's rocketed up the board in the sense of, like, okay, the name factor exists. But the step he's taken, so he was traded to Kelowna this year. And the step he's taken from last year to this year from a development perspective has scouts like jaws drop. They look at him and they're like high end motor, like his dad wins his puck battles, but he actually might be a better natural scoring talent than Jerome was at the same age. Wow. And, and we're talking about a, like a hall of fame caliber player in his yeah. father. And so when you look at it, scouts just rave about his one-on-one -on -one skill, his ability to just flat beat guys. And he's rocketed up the board. He started in my model around the mid twenties and with the scoring prowess that he's shown this year, he's like in the top 10. Now the other guy that I'd watch out for is Caden Lindstrom. He had, he missed a ton of the year with injury, but this is a player who, if I were drafting, I'd probably take it three instead of like the 12 or 13 that some people have. Why is that? Well, he's six foot four or five. We're not really sure on the measurements. He's a center. <laughs> Uh, and he he impacts the game in every single area of the ice. It's not often that you have a player at this age that is good at defensively and equally good offensively can impact the game in yeah. all 200 feet of the ice. He's already there, and he's somebody where in Medicine Hat, when you watch Medicine Hat with Lindstrom versus without Lindstrom, they're a completely different team. He gives them a dimension that they just don't have, and when you're looking at, let's say, a team like Anaheim, who right now is slated to draft third, if you have center depth of Leo Carlson and Caden Lindstrom and Mason McTavish, you're going to be pretty happy about that. That's a trio of like top three picks that are going to be impact centers at the NHL level. For sure. All right. Before I let you go, I wanted to pick your brain on some recent gambling news. Uh, you, of course, are in the gambling space, as everybody knows. You're quite good at it, as I know. Uh, the NBA is investigating the Raptors' Jonte Porter related to multiple instances of betting irregularities and prop bets wagering. How concerned are you about manipulation in this space when it comes to hockey, where things like shot props are becoming so popular in that market? Yeah. Uh, okay. So... I would say I'm not as concerned 
And the reason I'm not as concerned is because half the time the office officials don't get it correct anyways. <laughs> so I'm sitting here arguing with the NHL being like, I, with my own eyeballs, saw this shot. Here's the video clip. Correct it. So we're at a point where at least like in basketball, from a stat correction perspective, they get it right. Like there's not a lot of irregularity happening there. With the NHL, sometimes we don't get the proper corrections. Sometimes those corrections don't come until days later. And so I would say I'm not as worried because right now with how those things are tracked, until they're tracked by staff leads, by player tracking, whatever devices they want to use, what they're being tracked by the human eye. The That's like the least of my concerns, honestly, because... There's just so much more that can go wrong than a guy fixing his shots. And the other thing is, I think in hockey, it would be a lot more difficult to tell unless it was a star player. Like if Austin Matthews all of a sudden went eight games without more than two shots on goal, I might raise an eyebrow at that. But from like a, John Tay Porter is basically the equivalent of a third or fourth line player. Right. And given the matchups and given who you're playing, because there's such parity in the NHL versus the NBA... The, the a, a shot line for a third or fourth line player can fluctuate on any given night. They could have a good matchup. They might not have a good matchup. Their coach might sit them. They might not sit them. They might be on the power play. They might not be. And so I think I'm a little bit less concerned as it pertains to like the depth players because of how they're deployed. Um, and then from an off ice official standpoint, I think we probably ought to worry about that before we wonder about how much players are shooting the puck. Priorities says Rachel Dory. Priorities. <laughs> Exactly. Well, thanks for sharing some wisdom with us here on The Drop, and we will talk to you again soon before the draft happens. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right, it's time for Mascot Madness. We got eight, and by the end of this podcast, we will be down to four. And it has been an excellent tournament thus far, but now we have some incredible heavyweight matchups. And we're going to start with maybe the biggest matchup of this round. In the Weird Stuff division. To win the Weird Stuff division, we got Gritty taking on the Dallas Stars, Victor E. Green. Now, Wish, Victor mm -hmm. E. Green has mm -hmm. won 63.3% of the popular vote on That's Twitter. That's a you put trouncing of Gritty. That's shocking. Yes, that, that needs to be said. That is a huge factor in this one, absolutely. To me, when I look at this, Gritty is the number one overall seed. And I'll even go back to college hockey. We were just talking about it. It was next goal wins for the reigning national champion to be eliminated and also the consensus number one overall. That's how close it was. Okay. For me, Victory Green may not have been at the start of this tournament the one you thought of to eliminate Gritty, the mighty Gritty, the Tonight Show Gritty, the one that's streaking at uh, all outdoor games Gritty. But the people have spoken. 63.3%. Mm. Thousands of them have said, we want Victor. Wow. And so to me, Victor they shall have. For Victory Green's masses versus Gritty's silence in this tournament, for me, the winner in this round is Victory Green. Wow. Incredible stuff. I mean, I'm going to see this as a definite NHL mascot proxy for NC State knocking off Duke. I think many people would see Gritty as the Duke of NHL mascots, if uh -huh. you know what I'm saying. Uh -huh. uh, so congrats to Victory Green. What what a shocking, shocking development of Mascot Madness. Listen, next time, just get more involved, I guess. I don't want to tell you. Victory Green earned this one, okay? Everyone has a chance, a puncher's chance, and Victory Green got the job done. Birds and Aquatics, Wild Wing with 66.6%, .6%, very impressive, um, against Chance the Gila Monster of the Vegas Golden Knights. Conundrum, wish, conundrum, yeah. popular vote, Anaheim Ducks, Wild Wing, but Chance the Gila Monster yeah. has been the most vocal supporter of this tournament. Right. I, I, I think we have set the parameter that the popular vote was going to be a tiebreaker. And so that being said, my vote goes to Chance. I think he's been a revelation during this tournament. I think Chance has really impressed me both with uh, his engagement in the process and also his unbridled snark. <laughs> mm -hmm. So my vote goes to chance. And if your vote goes to chance, that means we don't go to the tiebreaker. 
Yeah, and I have to say, Chance has really leaned in on the pro wrestlingness of it all. I know. Uh, really the came, references he knows are, his audience. He knows yep, his audience. The, the references are through the roof for Chance the Gila Monster. While Victory Green is treating it like an election, Chance the Gila Monster is treating it like an angle, a storyline in pro wrestling. <laughs> and for that reason, if we were to go to a tiebreaker, it would have gone to Wild Wing, but no tiebreaker is needed here because we both vote chance and therefore chance moves on and eliminates wild wing howler right. of the arizona coyotes earned a pick em essentially 51 wow. percent of the vote wow. here against nash in the he's okay hold on a second obviously it's the cats division howler is not a cat but he could sweep the cats division wish i know uh, this is again this was a seating problem on our hands you, I listen. I'm going to give it to Howler. I got to be honest with you. I've been really impressed with Howler. I've been really get impressed with the Coyotes' engagement on this situation. Um, you know the social media push. I love Nash. Love the love the Predators. Love the party in Nashville. But my vote goes to the dog. Yeah, you know what? I and, and quite frankly, I like dogs more than cats. <laughs> So, yes, so there you congratulations, go. Howler. So, so Victory Green, Chance the Gila Monster, Howler, and I'm just going to go, I'm just going to make this quick. NJ Devil won 60.7% of the vote. NJ Devil moves on to me. Do you have any issue with this? I, I will just note the irony that the Devil's mascot defeated a Mickey Moose oh, close, what, like 30 years after Wayne Gretzky called the Devils a Mickey Mouse franchise. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Revenge. <laughs> revenge. Finally for the New Jersey Devils. Yes. Finally. Revenge over uh, an adjacent name. Uh, so there are your that's your final four. So it's going to be Victory Green versus Chance the Gila Monster and then Howler versus NJ Devil. Wow. All right, our final four, Victor E. Green taking on Chance the Gila Monster on the other side of the bracket, Howler versus NJ Devil. These are both incredible matchups because all four of them have been very vocal. So they're going to try to sway the vote as much as possible. They are indeed. It's going to be a wild finish. Yes, it is. Mascot madness. Yes, it is. So I guess we crown a, a victor next week. Yeah, we do. Well, I shouldn't use the word victor because that implies that Victor Green is going to win. Uh, we crown a winner. <laughs> the finale will be a howler. Uh, there's a chance you could win. You could also be bedeviled. Who knows? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, thanks for listening to The Drop. Thanks for rating, reviewing, and subscribing wherever you get your audio podcasts as well. Subscribing to the NHL on ESPN YouTube channel. We will see you on Friday for our comprehensive and full WrestleMania preview. <laughs> and, and hey, also it's our show. we can do what we want <laughs> let, we're going to give you half an hour on uh, the lapsed fan you could just basically uh, tell us uh, what you wrote in the article is that coming out by the way yeah lapsed it fan is. for okay. Wrestlemania coming out this week to catch everybody up on how we ended up with Cody Rhodes in two main events Yes, I, that's actually one of my favorite things that you do every year. Well, thank you. I think you do it for multiple events, but especially yeah, for WrestleMania, you do like a, a lapsed fan to just catch everybody up you in case you don't watch up. wrestling. Yeah, exactly. We're very busy. There's a lot of hours to watch <laughs> of wrestling, so I do my, I do my, my, my job. Uh, look forward to that, and we'll see you on Friday. Take care.